Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on cybersecurity. We're all working from home at the moment, and while that may mean working in your PJs, I promise I'm not, it also means that you need to be super vigilant about those criminals who, unlike us, are very comfortable in a virtual environment and just looking for opportunities to nab you. So I'm very pleased to say that today we have two experts from Mazars, one of whom you already know really well. Christo Sneeman has worked with many of us to sniff out those fraudsters and to help us as an industry protect ourselves against all manner of crime. He's joined by Terence Govender, who's the National Director of IT Advisory at Mazars. Suffice to say, Terence knows his way around cyberspace and we're very grateful to both of them today for joining us to help us as stakeholders in the tourism and travel industry to get through this time of COVID-19 when we're all working from home, we have no choice. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so very easily by posing your question in the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A folder. Just type your question in there throughout the presentation and we will take those questions to Terence and to Krista after the session. We will also be recording the webinar and we will release it to ASATA and SATSA members in the coming days. So don't worry if one of your colleagues is wanting the information and wasn't able to join today, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on demand. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Christo for a very brief welcome. Christo, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, Natalia, and thank you for facilitating this very important webinar. And I also just wanna say good morning to everybody joining on this Friday morning. Um, yeah, if looking at my diary today, I was scheduled to be in Johannesburg to give training to a group of travel staff. However, I'm now locked down here at home with you guys, you know, speaking to all of you over Zoom on working from home, cybercrime and COVID-19. How quickly the world has changed and how quickly we need to adapt. TNW also phoned me this week and asked on scams and how to protect the business. Um, from cybercrime and working from home. And the first thing that came to mind is that because all of us are in this desperate and unthinkable situation, criminals are definitely not in lockdown. And they are going to leverage on this situation to cash in. And while our focus is now completely diverted on saving our business agencies, serving our clients, paying our staff, collecting debt, and paying refunds to clients, it's of utmost importance, guys, that you safeguard your business against cyber criminals, especially the staff working from home, a lot of staff working from home. Before I'm going to hand over to Terence to give you guys just a bit of an in-depth view of, of safeguards, the one thing I want to emphasize to you today is when you make a payment, simple payment, make sure that you pay it in the correct bank account. Take, pick up the phone and phone your service provider, so phone your client, whoever you're going to make a payment, make sure you pay in the, in the correct bank account. Um, well, that's all from me now, and I'm going to hand over to Terence for in-depth discussion. Thank you, Christo. So Terence is going to share his screen because he's going to be taking you through a PowerPoint presentation. And then after the PowerPoint pre presentation, we will run through the Q&A. Please don't wait until the end of the presentation for your questions and answers. You can send those through and I will then facilitate them at the end. So Terence, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen for us and we can get kick-started into the very, very scary world of cybercrime and cyber, cyber criminals. Great stuff. Thanks, Natalia. Thanks, Crystal, for that. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think the first gripe I have uh, about the lockdown, if you have teenager kids, is the hole it's eating into my fridge. So if any of you do have that, I'm sure you'll empathize with me with the groceries that we bought for the month is now coming to an end very shortly. Anyway, let's move along. So the topic we're going to talk about is, is building cyber resilience. And um, I hope that at the end of this webinar, that you have at least some information on how to protect yourself uh, working from home. And if you're an employer, um, you'd have some information of what you need to do to protect then your business from that perspective. But I think before we go into that, um, let's just go through, <clears throat> just move this along. 
So we want to just look very quickly at, at what is a cybercrime? What does it mean? It's, it's an overtraded word today. Some people use it in context. So let's just understand what does that mean, and I'll break that down for you. Um, we'll then move into what is actually happening in the world today. And, and how is that related to then COVID-19 in the context of cybercrime? Um, we look at the industries that will be targeted and why will they be targeted? And then, as I said, you know, what can I do to safeguard myself and what can I do to safeguard my organization? And, and as we go along, if you have any questions, um, we will then deal with them at the, at the end. So let's look at, at firstly, um, the U.S. Department of Defense defines cybercrime as a computer orientated crime it's a crime that involves a computer and a network the computer may have been used in the commission of the crime or it may be the target cyber crimes can be defined as offenses that are committed against individuals or groups with a criminal motive to intentionally harm uh, the victim and to bring across some loss and i think the the key words there is that there's a computer involved there's a network that works across the globe and literally that computer is used in some form of fraudulent manner or illegitimate manner um, to bring about harm, to bring about loss to its victim. And it's essentially what, what it is. And, and, and if you think about cybercrime, it, it, it's what we call the new invisible thief. Because something's happening in the background. We can't see what it is, but we know something is happening. We can't see the criminal. We know that there's a network of them, but we can't see them. So that's essentially what is cybercrime. Let's move along in terms of, so what is actually happening in, in the world today? So firstly, we are seeing um, that crime is happening. The hackers are all across the globe. You will see the first article talks about the Moroccans that have hacked the Department of Social Development uh, in South Africa. Um, the next article talks about Post Bank that lost 30 million rand against a cyber crime syndicate. Um, and Standard Bank um, that was hit by a Japanese criminal company or syndicate um, and they lost 300 million rand through ATM fraud. We also saw in the, in the same time or more or less the same time, um, $32 million stolen from the Tokyo Cryptocurrency Exchange. Uh, and again, cryptocurrency is the new, you must have heard of Bitcoin. Um, that's essentially what hackers try and use these days because it's a way that you can move money around without having any identification. South Africa's uh, average breach cost jumps to 43.3 million rand. And that's basically, if I have a data breach and if someone hacks my system and takes or locks my records, the average cost to recover is about 43.3 million rand. And, and that is including the ransom that you potentially have to pay, the systems that I have to now have to upgrade and potentially the loss in productivity. So when my systems are locked and I cannot work, um, that my entire organization literally comes to a standstill. So the average cost um, has been increasing between five and 7% year on year. And that article, as you can see, was, was in July 2019. And on average, it's gonna cost you about 43 million Rand. So hacking is taking place. We can clearly see that. At the same time, you've got governance that is increasing. So King 4 reports come out. It's talked about the importance of corporate governance, but at the same time, um, you must have heard of the Poppy Act that is in the, in the imminence of being promulgated. I heard um, end of April, and that's going to give us 12 months to comply with the protection of personal information. In the UK, we already have the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, and that has been in play for almost two years already, and that is the same as, as South Africa's equivalent of the Poppy Act, but this deals with anyone in the European Union, and you can clearly see that they, they take no prisoners. So here they were, the, the European Union fined Italy gas uh, 11 million um, pounds um, for the... Um, um, I think they, in this case, um, let out or, or they, were, they were hacked and there was personal information that leaked out and basically they were in, in violation of the GDPR Act. So that's happening across the world. As cyber criminals are coming in, compliance is increasing, you're having more to comply with from an organizational perspective, more to protect, more data to protect at the end of the day. And these fines are coming in to ensure that, that the privacy of people's information and your information is, is in play. Now we have something called coronavirus outbreak. 
and, and now I want to step through what does this bring for us and how is this related to cybercrime now that you have a background as to what is happening in the world overall, what is happening before we even got to coronavirus, this is what's been happening in the world anyway. So what does this mean? Before we get into that, understand a little bit more information around on average, 75 records are stolen every second by hackers. 75 every second. 24% of data breaches are a result of human error, phishing or business process errors. Now I want you to hang on to that term phishing because we're going to unpack that a bit later. But 24% of the breaches are a result of human error. 30,000 websites are hacked every day. Every single day, people sit there and as Christo mentioned, um, you know, the, the cyber criminals, when we're in lockdown, they still sit behind the desk as we're trying to work now. They still sit behind the desk, and for them, this is a day job. They sit and they work to see who they can expose, who they can exploit, and what they can gain. It's a full-time job for some people. And the average cost of a stolen record on the black market is about 2,200 rand. And, and I'll bring up another slide where you can see across the industries, what is the average cost of these records? And the reason why these records are so expensive is because they contain personal information, they contain credit card information, they contain information that someone can exploit. And as the definition of cyber crime comes into play, it's to bring harm, it's to cause loss and to cause gain into someone else from that perspective. So let's just look at the cost per sector, right? And this is, this is the source of this is the Panama Institute report. It's called the cost of a data breach. And South Africa was part of this, um, this survey that was done and they've been doing for the last, I think almost 10 years now. But you can clearly see um, uh, at the top right, uh, sorry, right at the top, the health industry, okay? The health industry fetches around about $408 per record. Financial services, $206. Services, which I think the, the travel industry sits between services. And if you scroll right down to the bottom, about the fourth one from the bottom, hospitality and two more up transportation. So hospitality, transportation and services where you're sitting. So the average cost of a record on the market is around about 2,200 Rand based on the survey that was done with the health fetching probably the highest amount because of the personal information, the confidentiality behind it, and what it is worth out in, in the market or to be exploited. So let's move on. In the context of cybercrime itself, right? So, so what did COVID bring? What, what did the lockdown bring? It, it brought 21 days of us being isolated to prevent the spread of coronavirus. At the same time, it resulted in an unprecedented amounts of work from home situation. So work from home and remote working is not new. But let's face it, in every organization, it was a couple of people that either worked flexi time or worked from home on certain days. But it was never to the amount that you're seeing now where entire organizations are literally working from home. And it's not even working from a disaster recovery site. So what I'm also seeing is that uh, we've been involved in a few companies' business continuity planning. And let me tell you, nobody, Nobody had the eventuality of a pandemic. Everyone spoke about natural disasters, about office relocation, about a cyber hack, but nobody had a pandemic that resulted in people working from home. So everyone is, is literally having to review their plans to look at saying, how do we start to cater for this type of disaster? But at the same time, if I step it back into what does this mean for us now? So all types of employers and employees are vulnerable. There's, there's no isolation. As I said, these cyber criminals sit behind a computer and they see who's the weakest link. But now we want to go in a little bit deeper as to why are we at this point in time the weakest link or what makes us what, the most vulnerable. So firstly, when people are at home, they are more relaxed. And they generally have this mindset of cybercrime only happens at the office. So I'm okay at home because they're not going to target me, but wrong, we're going to see why in a, in a few minutes' time. Then we look at saying remote working users don't always have antivirus software. And what we call a virtual private network software or VPN, where you literally have a dedicated link between your PC at home and the office network, which is, which is far more secure. 
And then lastly, home computers are really protected with antivirus software or personal firewalls. And I mean, just think to yourself, I don't know how many of you, but you, you can have a thing for yourself. How many of you know that, yes, I've got antivirus software, and yes, I have a personal firewall uh, on my machine that protects me. And, and I can tell you from the stats that we have, um, few people have antivirus and even fewer people have, have personal firewall software. So this is why we become the, the target is because of that vulnerability that exists. We, we tend to be a little bit more relaxed at home and we tend, tend to think that we at home, the cyber criminal doesn't have access to us. And we're going to see why now, um, why that is actually the, the, the wrong thinking. So all of this creates the perfect playground for a cyber criminal. Let's see why. So as I said, everyone remains a target. Cyber criminals have no discrimination. They start with the weakest link. But there are, in this COVID-19 scenario, there are three groups of people, industries, or targets. Um, and we're going to look at why, and we're going to look at how. So first thing is, all home working users are at risk. Reason being, they have little to no antivirus software. They have no personal firewalls. And not all of them are working on computers that have secure links such as VPN. Unless you have an issued laptop from the office, and it has certain security software, you're a little bit more secure. But sometimes you need to send an email, so you now you use your home PC to send an email. Or your child needs to do some research, or you need to do some homework. So in that environment, if you're not secure, and all of a sudden you need to send an email to work, you're, you're starting to create a breach in that secure environment. The, the pandemic itself, because we're in lockdown, we spend a lot more time on the internet. So we're a lot more time online. We're surfing, we're browsing. And again, I'm going to tell you where and how that surfing and browsing becomes a risk to you. The next group of people that is a target are SMEs. And the reason why SMEs are the target is because they don't often have the budget to spend on security software, monitoring tools, or resources. So generally in SMEs, you might have one IT person. You, don't, might, you might not have a, a specific security person. Um, and from that perspective, you don't have the relevant tools. So if you do have the tools, it's not a real-time tool. So it will be a log file that someone will review from the day before, but someone could have already accessed your network the day before. Um, so from that perspective, SMMEs, purely because their spend is not as big as the bigger corporates do, um, but yet they still carry the same risk. So they still have, if I just take your travel industry, you have credit card information. You have a name, surname, addresses. You have a lot of personal information, which is valuable to the hacker out there. So, um, and at the same time, you might not have all the sophistication and all the tools to protect that information. Then what we're also seeing is that SMMEs now, if I take the restaurant industry, um, obviously in lockdown, they can't trade. So what they are doing is that they're moving to an online. So what they're offering is they're saying, still is an essential service, we'll prepare your meals and we'll have it delivered. Go online and select what you want. Now, they weren't geared to have an online presence because their main trade was day-to-day -day interaction with their guests and, and with their clients and customers. So now they put the service online, but they don't protect it. Um, so there's very little protection that goes with it in that respect. And then the last one um, is around the health and medical industry. So hackers are already claiming to have the sequence pathogen formulas in return for cryptocurrency. And again, so they, in desperation times, um, what actually happens is, is that we go and we're looking for the antivirus. We're trying to develop. And all of a sudden, someone comes up and says, I've got the pathogen. And, and these pathogens, if I look at the sequence coding, it looks legit. I, I'm not a, a scientist, but it looks legit. So when you get to desperate times and we start to run out of time, we will start to look at this and start to say, well, can we, can we look at this? Is there something significant that can be utilized to develop an antivirus? We start to pay cryptocurrencies and all of a sudden we find out that we've paid a huge amount of Bitcoins only to find out that the sequencing is for a flu vaccine. So those are already starting to happen. The other one is, is in the US and the UK. Uh, and I think Krista also reported that this morning, I think it's happening locally also, that scams are already being reported of sites that offer ventilators, masks, etc. Uh, you pay but no delivery. And again, um, if you just think about now how that happens, you have a parent, you have a, 
a son, a daughter, husband and wife that needs a ventilator. In desperation times now where countries are looking for ventilators, you find this, you think, oh, hold on a second, I can get this and I can save my family. And you go in and you subscribe and what do you know, no, no delivery. And then the website disappears. So we're going to talk through a couple of things around how to protect yourself from that perspective. So now that we understand what is happening, we understand why, let's look at how. So the first thing I want to talk about is phishing. Um, and, and phishing is really a very sophisticated way that criminals get some information about you or they just spread out a blanket email and the one who responds um, is who they start to work with. So a typical in this scenario is they will send you an email and they will say something accordingly of um, you have been in the shopping center for the last, um, in the last uh, week or so. And we believe that there were people that were infected. Please, can you complete this form? Tell us where you live, tell us your name and ID, and we will either send someone to you or we will point you to where you need to go. So again, just removing where there might be suspicion. And in the time of this, as Chris said, we're not focused on this right now. We focus on protecting our families. We focused on paying bills. We focused on a number of other things. This pops up. All of a sudden, you think, oh, hold on a second. Yes, I was exposed. Oh, what do I need to do? So you, you react and you complete the form and you provide all your information and they start to fish you. So now they've got all your information about you and they will start to exploit your accounts. They will log in and you'll find these um, activities happening through your bank account, which you never authorized. So that's what phishing is about. They essentially go in and they pull information. They, they request information and they make it look so legit that, that you will then complete the information the, that they require. Another one is also a, a typically good one is SARS. So they tell you you do for a SARS debate. Hey, everyone's excited about getting some money back from the receiver of revenue. And they say, just please complete this form. By then they already know your name. They've already picked up some form of identification. And you think, okay, this is cool. They know my name, so this has to be legit. And the site you know, will be www.sars e-filing and there'll be an extra G at the end. You'll never pick it up or an extra I in filing and you'll never pick it up. So you look at it, you think, okay, this is cool. You complete the form, you provide your information and they have that. The next thing I wanna talk about is ransomware. So what ransomware is, is really around where hackers get through either phishing or through you visiting a website. You click on something, you download, and all of a sudden they install what they call malware into your environment. The malware is a file that sits on your computer and records information, okay? And then once they have enough information, they then trigger this to lock your machine and then they come back and they send you an email or comes up on your screen to say your information has been locked. You now have to pay some form of ransom to unlock your machine. And that's where visiting these sites become very, very dangerous, especially sites that you don't know. And what we're also starting to see is that people are now sending links out to say, follow this site to find out more about Corona. Follow the site to find out more about the deaths in your area. Follow the site to find out more about who's infected in your area and the areas to stay away from apart from the lockdown. So you can see that there's a lot of sophistication that goes into the planning of the phishing, the malware and the ransomware, and ultimately where you now held at ransom to, to um, either uh, get your information back or to unlock your information. So these guys work, that's what they do full time, all the time and years through the, the areas that they are targeting. I must tell you though, that um, there, was, there was two, um, groups, um, I think around about late last week, that claimed that um, they, were, they were actually hackers out of the US, and they actually claimed that they will not um, hack any hospital, any medical institute um, during the time of COVID. So actually very brazen coming out saying, yes, we are the hackers, but we will not hack um, the, the, these health institutes. Uh, the one is called Maze, and the other one is called Doppelpaymer. Um, however, you know, until it happens, you don't know um, what they're going to do and are they doing it out of self-preservation or are they doing it out of altruism? So I think, you know, it's, it's a difficult one, but we'll have to wait and see. The, the thing is, there's value, there's money, as we've seen, and that's what they want at the end of the day. So now that we know and we understand what is happening, why it's happening, and, the, and where it could happen, let's look at, at how I can safeguard myself and what do I need to do? 
and we will make this guide available to you um, at the end of this webinar. So if it is a little bit small, I do apologize. But I think as employers, what you need to do is make sure that all your machines on your network have some form of antivirus software that generally scans for malware and will pick up and report something either to you on the screen or it'll send it to your IT department. And if people are working remotely, have some form of virtual private network installed that is a dedicated link between you and your server at the office and no one can intervene because it is a secure link that you have between the two. With that, you will then have something called two-factor authentication, which really is a password in addition to, for example, a, a number that will be sent to your, to your phone, and then you key in that with your normal login name and password. That's really verifying that it is me, that it's not someone else that is sitting in between trying to access my information. Um, then it's really just making sure that, you know, you change your passwords regularly from that perspective and you ensure that the password policy remains the same. So don't change your password policy because people are working from home to say change it every 90 days. If it's every 30 days, it has to change every 30 days. So I think those are the, the employers list from, from that perspective. As employees, make sure that when you work from home, you're logging into the network with a password. If you get a login screen and it doesn't come up with a password, something's wrong. Report it to your IT team immediately. Um, don't visit sites um, that are deemed unsafe or that your IT department may have already uh, warned you about from that perspective. Report any strange emails. So at this point in time, you know, um, no one from the office is going to be telling you things unbecoming. It will be a face-to-face -face conversation, or at least that's what I hope. So the moment you see a strange email coming in, requesting information, request, automatically be warned already and saying, mm, hold on a second, maybe this is not true, or let me follow up on the legitimacy of it. Let me phone someone at the office and verify this from that perspective. Things not to do. So Krista already mentioned around banking and banking to the correct bank account. Before you even get there, when you go into your Standard Bank or your EPSA, make sure when you type in www.epsa or Standard Bank or any other transactional place, make sure at the start of the universal link on your web browser, it says HTTPS. The S at the end stands for a secure link. Generally, if it just says HTTP and they ask you to do a payment, don't do the payment. Immediately, it is not secure and it is potentially a fraudulent transaction. Um, do not provide any pro confidential information to anyone requesting it unless, again, you have prior knowledge of it. Don't respond to any COVID-19 requests in any way. And at the same time, don't download any, any applications on your phone, uh, especially the Android phones. They're far more vulnerable than the iPhones or the iOS operating system. And don't respond to any email requests requesting personal information um, or, or company-related information. So this is available. I know it's, it's, it's pretty much a lot that we went through, but I'm hoping that you now have a better context as to um, literally what cybercrime is all about, why they're attacking certain areas, who's the focus areas, and what do I need to do to, to protect myself. So I think um, without further ado, uh, we will go into, into questions from that perspective. I thank you for your time, and I hope that I've given you some, something to think about and, and something that you can start immediately to, to protect yourself with. As I said, 24% of the hacking starts with user error. So if you can eliminate that, you would have reduced um, cybercrime by, by or access to cybercrime by 24%. I appreciate it and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Terence. Wow, now I'm terrified. You've literally <laughs> made my life a very, very, very scary place. Um, so you mentioned right at the end, and I've always been curious about this as a Mac user. Um, I've always been told our oh, Macs are much better when it comes to viruses and that kind of thing. Does it, does it depend on the system that you're working on, your, your ability to kind of weather this? cybersecurity pandemic, if you will. Yeah, so, so generally the way the Apple code is written um, in what they call iOS versus Android, it's a little bit, um, how do I say, it's a little bit more sophisticated in the security itself. So generally it, you can hack but it, it takes a lot longer, whereas Android or Windows devices, because it's far more available, there's more type of malware, there's more type of infections that happen 
um, in, in, in those type of environments in a normal desktop Windows environment versus the Apple Mac. So you're a little bit more secure. You're not 100% secure, but you are a little bit more secure from that perspective. Well, that makes me feel a little bit better. And we are getting some questions in um, asking about how you can kind of safeguard yourself because, you know, eliminating the human error that you were talking about is not always possible. If you are wanting to pose a question, just please post in the Q&A folder. They are coming in thick and fast. And just to refer to one of those questions, you know, what about having cybersecurity insurance? Now, I haven't been able to eliminate the human error. I'm caught. Would, would cybersecurity insurance help me through that? Is that something I should consider? So I don't know many companies that are offering cyber insurance uh, at this stage purely because of the risk that is so high and what it stands to, to um, uh, the loss uh, from that perspective. So I, I think cyber, cyber security insurance will help, but they might also restrict as any insurance policy strict, restrict the level of cover to limit their exposure from that perspective. Um, so I don't know. I think you'll have to follow that up with, with your insurance company and see to what extent will they cover uh, cybercrime. And also, of course, you can't do it retroactively. So you would need to have that cover Correct. in place prior to that um, situation actually happening. And as we know um, from discussions that we've had with Christo before, many of us have already been hacked. Many of us have already had our information spread out across cyberspace. We just don't know it yet. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, 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 you know, the most important thing is, and people tend to forget, things like Instagram, things like Facebook. Um, you know, you're posting things there every single day. And I think Facebook is probably the most hacked site on a daily basis. But nevertheless, you're putting that into public domain. Um, you go away on holiday, you tell everyone, oh, I'm gone on holiday, I'm here and there. But your location is on Facebook. So people can see, oh, Terence is sitting in Italy or, sorry, worst example, in the US and, and, um, and there's no one at his house. And by the way, here's his location of his house. So it's things like that that we give cyber criminals information about ourselves. And as I said, it's a full-time job. If they want to find something, there's a digital footprint, they will find it. So, yeah. so just be cautious about that and just do that, sorry, sorry, with the protection of personal information, with the puppy coming into play, as much as it protects you, but anything you put in the public domain, you are saying I'm, it's in public. So you can't expect the law and, and the legislation to protect you when you're putting that information in a public domain. Is there software, we've spoken about antivirus software and VPNs. Is there software that I can download onto my machine now that can protect me from phishing and malware, like flagging the fact that someone um, is, has been trying to fish me. Is there anything like that that I could download? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's lots for, I mean, Kaspersky is one of them. Um, McAfee is another one that comes to mind. Um, you just have to visit their websites and, you, and they've got many options from antivirus to personal firewalls to uh, protecting your passwords in your machine to um, locking down certain websites for kids. Um, and they will automatically, the moment you go into a website, will come up and flag you going into an unsafe website. Do you want to continue or not? Or you need a certificate for the site. And that certificate is really around that HTTPS that I spoke about around security. So absolutely, I think you can visit Kaspersky website or McAfee. And um, for a, a couple of hundred bucks, you can have yourself protected. And uh, Stanley's actually asked about Windows Defender. Is that, does that do the same as antivirus software? Yes, so Windows Defender does the same, um, but it's, um, so it will report, but the level of sophistication within the software. So if you take Kaspersky and you take McAfee, their whole product line and their service is around protecting. So they spend a lot more in R&D and they go a lot more deeper, whereas the, the standard Microsoft offering um, protects you, but not to the same level. Let me give you an example. Um, Microsoft Bitdefender might have, um, if you take your house and you put burglar guards on, okay, mm -hmm. it will protect you because you've got burglar guards. Now you take something like Kaspersky or McAfee um, and you find that they might have burglar guards and they're going to have beams and they're going to have an electric fence. So it depends on, uh, for me personally, I would rather go with something that someone specializes in because this is what they do day to day. Microsoft have an offering on it. It does protect you, but it, in my opinion, doesn't give you the same level of protection 
that a company who specializes in something like that would offer. So I, I would just be better. It's like, <laughs> it's like going into a steak restaurant and asking for a King Clip special. I just, I just wouldn't do that. <laughs> so you can actually take the antivirus that's installed on your laptop and yes. kind of pop it up to make sure that you're a little bit more secure. Absolutely. Look, I'd rather have that than nothing. So don't get me wrong. I mean, if, if all you got, if the option is all you have is, is the Microsoft default, please go ahead and do that because it's better than having no protection at all. It's at least something that if someone tries to walk past your house and, and they see, oh, hold on a sec, there's a house, there's a window open, there's no burglar doors, there's no burglar bars, let me gain access to it versus, oh, hold on a sec, the window's open, but there's a burglar bar, let me go to the next house. Yeah. So it, it does give you some form of protection Absolutely. And if that's all you have, go with it. It's better than nothing. Okay. So Stephen um, is obviously someone who loves systems because he's talking about Office 365 and SharePoint, which I also use. Um, he's saying, is that more secure than using a VPN to log onto a locally hosted server? We are using SharePoint and 365 with Mimecast for remote workers too. Okay, so I think, again, Office 365 and SharePoint, the way it's set up, I mean, Microsoft's got quite a bit of security built into the 365 platform, as well as to the SharePoint platform. But again, if I think about any environment, it would not hurt to have a VPN in relation to both the SharePoint and the Office 365. It just gives you that extra level of protection because in the 365 environment and a SharePoint environment, I'm still accessing it across the internet. And unless I've got a virtual private connection back to my server, I'm still exposed from the internet perspective because that's sitting in the, in the web. It's sitting in a cloud somewhere. Okay. So it'll, it, as much as Office 365 and SharePoint is protected in the cloud, how you access that information um, could then be compromised if you don't have a virtual private network. So again, anything that you can add to it makes it secure. Uh, right from your laptop, right through into the internet, into your office, wherever you're transacting from. So it does give a level of protection. But again, if I think about our environment, we have a VPN, we have also a SharePoint, also a 365, but we have VPN and we have a 365, uh, sorry, a, a two-factor authentication method of, of um, authentication. So okay. the more you have, the, the, the more difficult it becomes. Yeah, and even I suppose with something like Google Docs or using um, Dropbox, for example, to upload documents too, if I had that overlay of a VPN, that would be even more protection for me because I just have this assumption that I'm working on a cloud and so everything should be fine. Hunky-dory, not so. Correct, not so. <laughs> Damn, Terence, you've just blown me out of the <laughs> I'm so sorry, but, but this is the reality of what you're dealing with. That is a pretty scary thing. Okay, so there's a lot of technical stuff going on there. I want to just bring it back to me as kind of a lay person who doesn't really understand the whole IT side of things and this, this idea of phishing. So our minds fill the gap. I know that that's what happens. And you were speaking about phishing where you've got an email that's come from SARS and there's an extra I in filing. I haven't picked it up. But I get, I'm not lying, probably about four to 500 emails a day. So now I'm actually terrified um, about actually clicking on any links within the email. You've mentioned one example of where I could get caught out when it comes to phishing. Are there any other examples that you can think of, think of off the top of your head? Yeah, so, so the one is basically phishing, which is, which is through email. Then you get SMS, which is called smishing, <laughs> okay. um, where, where, where people will then also send you an SMS and say, listen, we've seen this, we've observed that, uh, please click on this link, which also takes you to a page or takes you to an app, uh, asks you to download, and that's where the malware starts or that's when they start to get information. Then you get vishing, which is the voice side where people will phone you and say, look, you know, very convincingly, this is what we see, this is what we found, and here's the number, we need this information to help you do X, Y, Z. And at that point, they already, for some reason, have some information about you. Um, and they just try and exploit that even, even further. So yeah, they, apart from phishing, you get smishing, which is SMSs, you get vishing, which is voicemail, um, and then obviously then, then just onto a website, downloading information you know, or downloading anything is where the malware will then start if you don't have something that will pick up a signature or a file that says, hold on a second, this is not a legitimate file. So what you're saying is trust no one, essentially. <laughs> yes. 
great. <laughs> um, and I think the human error side of things is the problem because as much as you're telling me to do this, to do that, and I own a small business, do this, make sure that you're not looking at that. And, and my team is a virtual team. So they're very savvy in a virtual environment with the amount of content that is being pushed at us constantly at the moment, because we're all in a virtual environment, it's very, very difficult to eliminate that human error. Very, very difficult. So you would have to have something like a VPN and all your antiviruses in place. That's the one thing I would need to do today to make sure that that is in place. Would you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that there's absolutely no doubt that, you know, we are human. And, and as much as we can work towards eliminating that, at some point in time, we are going to be vulnerable to something. So it's always better to have then a VPN or some form of technology. For example, I know both Kaspersky and McAfee, um, if you have the um, software installed and I think you take the, the full package, um, the moment you try and download it, scans your email, it'll come back and tell you, there's a file here that unless you know the source, please don't click on it. So unless you know you're expecting something from Terence or from Christo or anyone else, don't click on it. If you are expecting it, then yes, you are expecting it. It is a legitimate email, then click on it. But it will pick up these type of things. 100%, Natalia, I think, I think as human beings, we can never be 100%. And, and as much as we try, I mean, we can get the 24% down to 4%. There's still the 4% risk. The 4% can become 2%. There's still a 2% risk. And okay. that's all it takes. If you um, have not posed a question and you want to, you have a few minutes left to do so. Just click on your Q&A folder at the bot at bottom of your screen and type your question. I'm going to go back to some of those questions that we have received. Um, this is an interesting one from GP Venser where he talks about uh, banking sites that don't have that HTTPS, but the little lock that when you click it says, this site is secure. Is that secure or are we being hoodwinked? So no, if it doesn't have the S, they don't have a security certificate. Even though there's a lock on there, it has to say the S. So I think in that case, I've never come across um, a, a banking site that, I've, that doesn't have the S. Then, then they're obviously using something completely strange. But in the normal tech terms, the S by all banking sites or any secure, any, anything online will definitely have the S on there. And with the S, you'll then see the lock. If there's a lock with no S, I wouldn't trust it. Okay, so Brent says he's read something that more than 100,000 domains have been registered since the start of COVID-19. Are there any government interventions in place to weed out criminal activity in that number? And that's such a good point. No, 100%, and I fully agree. I, I think I read the same article, and that's where the increase in domain registration and these um, pop-up sites have come about with years of mask, please, or a ventilator at this price, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, unfortunately, registering a domain is not regulated. Um, and I can register a domain without having a bank account, without having a, um, sorry, without having a, a registered company. All I need is a bank account. And even that could be a debit order bank account. A little debit card will work as well. So unfortunately, there's no regulation in the sites. What does give some form of uh, comfort is that when you apply for what they call a digital security certificate, which gives you the S, there's a whole host of compliance that you have to go through. So when you see the S, you do know it's secure. You do know that there's a level of, of authorization and authentication that went into because not everyone will get that certificate to authenticate with. So unfortunately, 100%, there's, there's lots of websites that's come about in the last two to three weeks. Um, and I think we're still going to see more of that uh, from that perspective. And unfortunately, it, it is not regulated. So my and it's very difficult to, to determine what, unless it is a, a has the S on, it is very difficult to determine what is legit and what is illegit. So my thanks to Daryl, um, who's just pasted in the chat and said, make sure you, you use a new modern browser and that it's up to date, because that will also warn you that the site is not secure. Uh, and then we have Sandro, who said, Internet Explorer shows HTTPS, Google, Google Chrome does not. How can you see it on Google Chrome? You just have a look here. That's a very good point. Do you can you respond to that, Taryn? Yeah. So I just want to have a look at mine also. So um, if I go to Google, remember Google at the point. So if I go to Google, I see HTTPS comes up, and which was the other one? No. So he said on Internet Explorer it does show the HTTPS, but on Google Chrome it does not, and that surprised me because I have 
have it on my Google Chrome, which is why I'm... Yeah, I'm also on my Google Chrome, and mine also comes oh, up with not. HTTPS. You might have to just look at your version of Chrome. Okay. All right. So it's just about making sure that you're... Because people don't re remember that they've actually got to update their... Um, yeah. their so, absolutely. So what's also important is is in the home environment, when we, when we register, and, and this also talks to illegal software, but when you register legal software with Microsoft, whether it's, it's your desktop or Office 365, they will constantly push updates to secure your environment. So they know you're registered and they'll know they do a check on their side and they'll see version 2.5a is now released uh, or, or is expired version 2.5b and they will automatically push an update. Either it happens automatically or they'll ask you, do you want to update your system? And it updates. Where you have, for example, previously where you had unlicensed software. So I buy the software and I give it to Natalia. Natalia loads it on her machine and it works, but some features are restricted. Those are also exposed because you're not getting those updates as I'm receiving it because you've got an illegal or unlicensed version of that software. So you also need to make sure that whether you, uh, if you are legitimately have software, that you do have the latest browsers if it's not updated automatically, um, because that also creates all of these software comes with bugs, uh, as we call them. And what we then need to load is something called a patch or a fix to address that vulnerability that exists. Generally, today's time, you know, over the last few years, these things happen automatically. Previously, you had to manually go in and update, and that's I'm not even going to go there in the discussion because it happens automatically. Unless you're sitting with the machine that is 10 years old, you've got a problem. Yeah, and I'm actually seeing on my Chrome now, there's a, like Ilza, there's a little lock on the left-hand side, and Daryl's just said that um, the lock in the address bar indicates that it is secure. So if you're on Google Chrome, like I am, and that little lock is not there, that's the equivalent of the HTTPS. Uh, interestingly, a question around incognito. So I often do that because I'm working on content and I need to see what other people in the world are seeing if I Google something. Does it make a difference if you browse incognito or will that HTTPS still come through? No, so, so look, when you browse, so let's just go back a step. So when you browse a site, right, or when you go in and Google and you do a search and you go into, into a website, not all sites that you're going into where there's no transacting needs to also have the HTTPS. So that's something I want to make clear. So if you go into a site and you just want to look for something and you want to download something, it's always good to have to make sure that the site is there, that, that it's secure, right? But if you're not transacting anything and you're not putting any information down on there, it's okay to still browse the site. The, the security comes in when I have to download, or sorry, when I have to put in information of my own, or I have to put in credit card information, I have to transact, I have to pay for something. That's when the S actually becomes very, very important. So you can still go in into an HTTP site or the lock site that doesn't have the S, provided I'm not, I'm not transacting anything on that site. Okay, so somebody actually spoke about Zoom a little bit earlier, and those of you who use Zoom will have noticed this morning that it had asked you to upgrade it. That is because, and I experienced that firsthand, not in my own meeting, but in someone else's meeting, that there were hackers on the loose, and they were hacking chats, yes. popping in with videos which were very inappropriate, and Zoom has now fixed that patch. So since you are all on Zoom at the moment, and if you haven't upgraded Zoom, may I suggest strongly that you do do that today, um, Zoom is secure, but it was hacked like I suppose everything can be. Yeah. And, and again, Natalia, I mean, because they've picked up that people are working remotely, they're looking at collaboration tools. So they're looking at Zoom, they're looking at Skype, they're looking at Microsoft Teams. They started hacking all of these to get access to these chats. But again, can you see how quickly it's moved now? Um, between between just looking at people from home, but then now they've got more sophisticated from a perspective that they're looking at, at ways that they know people are going to collaborate. So what next is to look at the collaboration tool. So they'll look for the next vulnerability that exists always. And the vulnerability in social media, as you said now, because people have time, well, I don't, but people have time to have a look at their social media profiles. Uh, now more than ever, you should be going into your preferences and making sure that you have set them as strictly as possible, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. I think a lot of people go in, set up their Facebook, set up their Insta, set up their Twitter profiles, and they don't go back and check the security settings. And by default, it's always open. It's not restricted. You need to go in and you need to restrict who has access to what and who sees what from that perspective. I think Facebook's now changed that. Um, again, coming under strict compliance with the U.S., but um, generally, most of them don't have or come in with 
with you have to go and set those privacy settings. How secure is using QR codes for online payment? Do you have a view on that? Sorry, say that again. How secure is? How secure is using a QR code for online payment? Would that be a <sighs> way of of contract? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so again, I mean, uh, you know, the QR code itself, depending on where it gets generated, it, at one stage it was also the most hacked because anyone could generate a QR code and then flash that. You scan the code and then you you do with payment. Um, I, I haven't done, to be perfectly honest, enough research on QR codes just yet. Uh, I do know that that earlier, a couple of years ago, they were very very vulnerable because anyone could generate a QR code. And that's the difficulty in it is, is, is just picking up like a lot of the snap scan use the QR codes um, and, and it's it behind it is security. Um, it's, it's some of these, again, if someone just sends you something to do a payment and you haven't seen it, and you haven't used it before, I would be very wary about using something completely new. If it's something that you have used before, then absolutely there's security behind the QR code itself. And, and Suzanne has also just raised a very, very important point is that we, we tend to think that the cyber criminals are out to get us on our laptops, but one doesn't actually think about one's mobile phone, which we use probably more than our laptops. Um, so how secure are apps on your phone, such as a banking app, for example? So if you, so I'm going to talk about one. It's just, so A, the, the phone itself is, is probably the most risky, 100%, and your iPad and any other device that you have in your house that you're connecting to the internet. When you connect to the bank it's app itself through the browser, okay, the security on the S means that the bank side is secure, but the way you're transacting on your data SIM card or your Wi-Fi through to that banking app is exposed, right? Rather download the app because the app itself and allows a VPN connection between you and the banking site itself. So in my opinion, when you are using banking, rather use the, the banking app. Don't transact over the internet uh, on the browser of your devices. That is, that is dangerous. Uh, okay. I would just use the app. I would use your app all the time. Yeah. And in addition, I wouldn't go into malls and use the free Wi-Fi. Uh, unless again the Wi-Fi is secure and you have to put a password in that again gives it some security. So again, you can use the app, the browser I'd be very worried or very aloof to because of the fact that that if you don't have a VPN and you're literally using it across the browser, the banking app itself, the banking site itself is secure on the S. But the information you're transacting in between is not, is not secure. Wow. Okay. So if we're getting an email from a bank saying da 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 and you click there and it goes through to the bank's website and then you put your password in, that would be a lot less safe than me just going straight to my banking app and contracting there for what I need. Yeah, 100%. And that's why the banks have pushed a lot of the security into the app itself so that you can transact in that manner. And where the bank will ask you to use the website, then they'll do the two-factor authentication. So what they'll do is they'll send you the email. You can click on it they have a registered cell phone number with you. They will then say, put in your login and password, and then they'll send you a code on your phone. You then type that code in, in addition to your password. And the moment the two of them are not in sync, the transaction will stop. Okay. So that's the only time, but the bank will send you that. If no, if no one else should be sending you that, the bank will send you that. And that's the two-factor authentication if you don't have an app on your phone. And of or course, you're not using that. Same applies. You have to update your browser. You've got to update your phone on the latest version, and you've got to make sure that when your apps need to be updated, they're all updated. Correct. Okay, uh, Carla, how safe is it to use the autofill when filling in forms on the internet? That's my favorite thing, Carla. Uh, Carla, um, I I personally don't use the autofill because you don't know where that information is being recorded in the autofill itself, unless, for example. Um, you again, let, let's take um, uh, a bank inside or let, let's take, I don't know, um, let's take discovery or, or in your health provider and you go in, there's a HTTPS and you have a pre-populated uh, information. Now, generally that pre-populated comes from a secure background of who's hosting it. And let's say it's your medical aid provider, right? That's safe enough. But when I go into a site and it's pre-populating from my web browser, onto a page that I've never seen before, that 
that to me is risky. By default, personally, for me, I don't use any pre-populated information. I capture information from scratch at the time and I don't save anything to my browser because people have access to your browser. And when you keep that automatic payment, when you do a payment and you say, save my password to the browser, I don't enable that. That's just me personally. Um, Purely because people can have access to, in fact, I can go into your screen, I can open up and I can just have a look in plain text, all the sites you visited, all the logins and all the passwords that you have, um, it can either be displayed or I can, with a little bit of information, I can have it in plain text. So it can wow. either be encrypted or I can have it in plain text. And that's there on your browser right now. I'd rather you didn't, Terence. You can keep answering these questions. <laughs> How secure are the SSL pay sites like Scroll, for example? Yeah. Are they so SSL? Yeah, SSL is secure. So um, that stands for Secure Software Link. Um, so SSL is secure. Um, all the payment sites generally are secure. Um, and you'll see they will offer the, that two factor authentication where you register, and they will also then pop you a. a um, um, uh, alpha numeric key or a numeric key to your phone which you then have to key in back to the site and then they they, they validate or verify that it is you so anything with SSL is is secure and uh, like I said I've never hardly ever come across anything that is that is regarded as SSL that's not secure and again something like like a Spurs key or um, McAfee, if it goes to a site where the certificate has expired, so you might have an HTTPS or SSL link site and it expired, it will tell you the certificate is expired, you might not want to trust the site, which means if it is someone who's hosting and they haven't renewed that certificate, which means it hasn't been validated, you are at risk. You're now putting in your information <clears throat> with, at your peril without being validated in any way. So it's important also for these organizations to renew their certificates, they pay a bit of money, but it gives the legitimacy and security around it. Okay, we've got four minutes to go until the end of our webinar. Naresh has pointed out that with Kaspers uh, Kaspersky Internet Security, there is a plugin on Chrome or Firefox and Internet Explorer, which by default is not enabled. One has to actually install to enable it. So there's, there's a plugin essentially on Kaspersky Internet Security. So that's good to know. Um, can I pop into things to look out for? So we've had the question, what sorts of anomalies would you look for to identify whether or not your system has been compromised to give me a little bit of a tip off? Sure. So again, without having the software, it's really very difficult. Malware can sit on, I mean, we, we've done investigations and we've done uh, clients where we went to where we've traced malware sitting on their servers for three months before it was actually activated. Um, it's very, very difficult to see or to spot with the naked eye. Um, again, the only other way to look at it would be um, through phishing. So to looking at, at any emails that's coming in that um, you is really around looking for information or want you to update something. That will be the first, I would say, more uh, easier point that you would look for. Um, the second would be, you know, visiting a website and, and looking or downloading something and then they'll ask you, do you want to write or modify your file? Immediately, no. Um, uh, and again, unless you've got the, the Kaspersky or McAfee software or Bitdefender, whatever it is that will read a file, in, in almost binary or ones and zeros that will tell you. Unfortunately, more than that, you know, there's nothing that's visible to the naked eye. And is there a way for us to report cybercrime? So let's say somebody contacts us and says they have hacked us and we must pay them a small fortune. Normally I just delete those emails, but can I report them to someone? So yes and no. So um, the cyber bill with puppies coming into play. So at this stage, you're not requested to report them and there isn't any major line that you can report to it is coming out though where where you will be have to from a puppy perspective and a cyber perspective you have to report the breach and you have to record the breach right now the only people you can report it to is your internal organization and what you can do is log it with saps so so saps are starting to gear up their cyber criminal they already have a cyber criminal division and all of that can re be reported to the saps but a specific number will be made available in the near future so for now it's just saps to report the cyber crime other than that um, there, there isn't anything available right now but there will be in the future that you will have to report this from a compliance as well as from an investigative perspective so for now it's just saps 
Okay, so I'm going to unfortunately close the webinar now. We've reached our one hour uh, limit, but there are a couple more questions that have come through and I would ask you if you could please just send those through to me at asata at bigambitions.co.za asata at bigambitions.co.za and I'm sure Terence will help me respond to those. I do want to leave with this just last comment that Leandra has um, shared with us and she said, I want to reconfirm what Terence has said in terms of Kaspersky. I'm using this at home to protect my homework environment and for my kids on their phones and school research projects, personal laptops. A few years ago, we had a hacked attempt by an online farming game that my son was playing. It's a real threat and it is scary. The hackers are clever. They will try to access work laptop through the back door, your children's devices, for example. So please take Terence's advice. On that note, Terence, I'd like to thank both you and Krista for joining us today and for all the attendees who joined us as well. Again, if you do have a question or you had a question that we were not able to answer during the session, please email me at asata at bigambitions.co.za. I promise I'll click on it and not delete it because I think it's cyber security or cyber crime in the work. <laughs> And I do hope that everybody is having a very good day and a good weekend. And please stay safe and stay strong at this time. Thank you guys for joining. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye.